Hey, you guys. This is Paul Lutheran, your friend, the ordinary Lutheran North Country guy. And I've come to, well, you see, Pastor Doug, he asked me to make an announcement about our Get Wisdom Challenge, eh? So we are going to be reading the book of Proverbs during the month of August, because you know there's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs and there's 31 days in the month of August. So if we read one a day, we're going to be able to read the book through together in a month and that will help us to be wiser people. And I will be coming on once in a while with my good Lutheran copy to, to tell you, or maybe without it, but I'll be coming to tell you something that I find in the chapter every day. In fact, by the time you see this, we've already started. But that doesn't mean you can't join us. We'll be on our Facebook page at St. Paul Lutheran Church in Ironwood. I don't know exactly how the address goes, but I bet you can figure it out. And I think also on YouTube. So, I will hope we'll see you there. Okay, good. Now I can never figure out where I'm supposed to click. There it is. Hello friends, Pastor Doug Norquist here, welcoming you to this service for the ninth Sunday after Pentecost, August 2nd, 2020. Though of course, as always, you can watch it or join in any time that you wish. I'm here as usual with my bride, Shirley, who is as usual off camera. And I'm glad to have her here, even if it's only off camera. We are here for St. Paul Lutheran Church in Ironwood, Michigan, and one more time for the Psalm Shared Ministry of Wakefield and Besmer, Sharon of Besmer and All Saints of Wakefield. Their interim pastor with the possibility on both sides of turning it into a longer term call begins on August 8th. So this is the last Sunday in which you will be directed by your own website or wherever you're looking to find us. You're always, of course, welcome to join us. We thank you for being with us for these, I think it's been five services, where I say you're welcome to join us, but I am emphatically not trying to steal you away from your own congregations. I want your congregations and Pastor Johnson to succeed. So blessings upon you in this new time. I hope you enjoyed a little temple talk that we had from Paul Lutheran, the ordinary Lutheran North Country guy. I hope that you will be able to join him as you are able for the Get Wisdom Challenge, eh? That you can find his comments on our Facebook page, St. Paul Lutheran Church, Ironwood, or something like that, and the YouTube page, or YouTube, I think we'll also have it there. We're ready to begin, and our worship begins with hymn number 807, if you have Evangelical Lutheran worship to turn to. Come the fount of every blessing, turn my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy ever ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. While the hope of endless glory fills my heart with joy and glory, teach me ever to adore thee. May I still thy goodness prove. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Here to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. 
Let that ring sound like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I know. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Our order for service continues with a brief order of conf confession and forgiveness on page 211 in the front part of the book. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom our hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and whether they magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin, and made us alive together with Christ. It is by grace that we are saved, and it is in the name of Jesus Christ that I declare the forgiveness of sins to all penitent sinners. Almighty God, strengthen you with power and through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. As we sometimes do for the Lord Have Mercy section, I invite you to think of a situation in which the God's mercy is needed. Maybe your life, maybe in the world, maybe in our government, and Hold that as a, in your, as a picture in your mind before God, and then repeat after me. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. God, glory to God, glory to God in the highest. Glory to God, glory to God, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, the heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God in the highest. Glory to God, glory to God, and peace to God's people on earth. Oh, Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, for God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. 
Glorious God, your generosity waters the world with goodness, and you cover creation with abundance. Awaken in us a hunger for the food that satisfies both body and spirit, and with this food fill all the starving world. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I'd like to have a little time with the children here, and especially for you. As always, young people, we are just so glad you're with us, so glad that you are part of us. I want to talk about uh, our passage today that's from Isaiah that starts out in an interesting way. When we hear it in English, we wonder, what in the world is that about? Because it starts out with the word ho. It says, ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And... We don't really have that word in English. They just took it right over from the language that this was translated from. And But what it is, I think, is like the cry of somebody that is out on the street and there are um, a street vendor trying to sell something. So you get someone that would say, Oh, everybody, come get my vegetables or whatever it is they're trying to sell. And in this case, he says, Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You who have no money, come and buy and eat. Sounds kind of funny to say, if you don't have any money, come and buy. But the prophet wants you to feel that kind of, it's kind of weird feeling because they don't go together. And here's the thing I really want to, is what he says that I really want to share with you today. He says, why do you spend your money on that which is not really bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Now he's not talking here about like an actual street vendor who's out in the street and, and we're not talking about bread here or water in the sense of what we actually drink physically with our bodies. He's talking about the way that we sometimes go after things to feed our soul, to make us feel okay on the inside that aren't really that good for us. So people, uh, the one example is the first thing they do if they're feeling bad is they go to the refrigerator and find something sweet to eat. And there's not anything wrong with eating sweets once in a while, but it would be better for our bodies if we would just eat the things that are good for us and just a little bit of sweets. There are other ways that we do this too. But what God is saying is, come to me first in prayer. And then he's promising something really special. This is a, a kind of a prophecy pointing ahead to Jesus coming. To Jesus, not, I said kind of a prophecy, didn't I? That's stupid. It is a prophecy. And it's pointing ahead to Jesus coming to us to die for our sins and to make it possible for us to come to God, receive his grace. That's when God gives us not what we deserve, but what's good for us just because God loves us. And... He calls us to eternal life with him and to the gift of heaven with him. And so that is something that is really going to satisfy. In fact, it's really going to keep us alive in the end. And everything that you and I try to do won't. Because sooner or later, every one of us dies. Probably be a long time off for you. But 
It happens to everybody. And when that happens, God wants you to know that in Christ, you can be raised again and live forever. Let's pray. Help us all to turn to you for the things that really nourish and to receive from you eternal life and abundant life. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again, young people. Glad that you're with us. Our first reading today comes from Isaiah. I've already made reference to it with the young people. The prophet writes this, Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Our psalm comes from Psalm 145. We won't be singing a response today. Just what was the usual psalm tone back when we were gathering live in person. And I invite you to sing with me or to sing responsively or whatever works for you. It'll be verses 8 and 9 and then 14 to 21, in case you're having to find your psalm in the hymnal and work from there. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Lord, you are good to all, and your compassion is over all your works. The Lord upholds all those who fall, and lifts up those who are bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon you, O Lord, and you give them their food in due season. You open wide your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. You are righteous in all your ways and loving in all your works. You are near to all who call upon you, and to all who up call upon you faithfully. You fulfill the desire of those who fear you, when you hear their cry and, cry and save them. You watch over all those who love you, but all the wicked you shall destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord. Let all flesh place God's holy name forever and ever. Our second reading comes from Romans chapter 9. The Apostle Paul writes, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. 
For our scripture response today, we're using the first verse of hymn number 515. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me, as once you broke the loaves beside the sea. Beyond the sacred page, I see you, Lord. My spirit waits for you, Lord. Our gospel reading comes from Matthew chapter 14. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when Jesus heard about the beheading of John the Baptist, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. And he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides the women and the children. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And let us pray. Open my mouth and open our hearts so that your word may go forth and move in our lives by your Holy Spirit's grace. Amen. It seems that even for Jesus, things didn't always go according to plan. I'm not saying he was mad. I'm not saying he was flustered. But Matthew clearly tells us that Jesus had gone to a deserted place by himself, meaning just him and his disciples. And the circumstances were that John the Baptist had been murdered by a capricious ruler and the ruler's vindictive and nasty wife. And in the story also was his stepdaughter and who knows what her motives were. John's death had to have hit Jesus hard on multiple levels. The sheer tragedy of it, the injustice of it, the galling banality of the apparent motives for the actions, the personal loss for Jesus. We don't know just how close he was to John, but they were relatives. The loss of a colleague. I mean, maybe nobody can really be called a colleague to Jesus, but if anyone would, it would be John. And then the sense that Jesus must have had that he was next. That the next time a prophet of God was unjustly killed at the hands of wicked rulers, it would be Jesus. In short, Jesus must have been exhausted. He must have felt close to the end of his tether physically and emotionally and spiritually. He must have really felt the need for quiet. That the crowds were there and they were needy. And Jesus must have drawn strength from somewhere, no doubt from his heavenly Father. Matthew says that he had compassion on them and healed their sick. 
Mark says that they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he taught them many things. Luke says that he welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those in need. As the day wore on, it became apparent that the people in their spontaneous rush to be near Jesus had not planned things very well. Whatever food they might have brought along was used up, and it was late, and they were far away from home. Remember, Jesus had been looking for a deserted place. And the disciples must have been talking among themselves about what to do with this mess. And remember, they had their own grief over John, and some of them had been his friends. At least they had spent time with him. And Luke tells us that they had just been on a major ministry trip. They were tired. As the day wore on further, it seems that the disciples felt that they had a solution worked out and they came to Jesus with it. Get rid of them. Not that they put it that way. This is how they actually put it. This is a deserted place and it's getting late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the village and buy food. And I'll take a moment to notice here that they were telling Jesus what to do. That wasn't recommended behavior when you're dealing with a rabbi that you respect. And it shouldn't be recommended behavior for dealing with the Son of God either. But before we get too critical, let's admit that people like you and me do this all the time. In our prayers, we approach the throne of grace with prayer, but it's shopping lists. Lord, we need this and we need that. Here are our plans, please bless them. I could understand it if God were asking, now oh, wait a minute, who's in charge around here? Who's giving the orders here? But to give credit where credit is due, Let's acknowledge that the disciples could have done something even worse. They could have taken matters into their own hands. I could have imagined Jesus, uh, Peter marching around and shouting, All right, everybody, it's getting late. Time to go home. Come on, beat it. Scram. And another disciple, perhaps Nathaniel, more genteelly. Ladies and gentlemen, please take note of the hour. Kindly prepare to vacate the premises well before sunset. Now, it was far better that at least they went to Jesus first before doing anything. And likewise with our own prayers. I am not, to put it mildly, the first preacher that has scolded people, as it were, for using their whole prayer time to present God with lists of stuff they want. But even this is better than not praying at all. And give petitionary prayer its due. We are supposed to ask for things. The Bible repeatedly teaches us by precept and example, that is to say, by what it teaches and by what it shows us people doing, to ask God for things. You can even look at the prayer we call the Lord's Prayer. The one he taught us as a model prayer, the one that begins, Our Father who art in heaven. Seven times in that short prayer, we ask for things. Anyway, what really mattered in the end was that Jesus was there and that the people listened to him. What really mattered is that Jesus was there and the disciples approached him. It didn't even matter much that the disciples were dead wrong in what they asked for. You know what happened. The tiny bit of food on hand somehow proved sufficient to feed that huge crowd. And so with us, what really matters in the end is that Jesus has come for us. What really matters is that Christ is with us. By all means, let us come to him and through him to God. And let us learn all we can about how to pray. And let us try not to run ahead of him in our anxiety and frustration with life. But even if we should happen to do that, it would doubtless be turn out okay as long as we are looking to him.
Let us pray. Father in heaven, may we keep coming to you, and coming to you may we experience the depths of your love. Make provision for every need, we pray, but still more, be for us yourself the true provider. Amen. Now we will sing the other verses of that hymn, number 515. <laughs> Bless your own word and truth, dear Lord, to me. As when you blessed the bread by Galilee, then shall abundance cease, all matters fall. And I shall well my peace, my all in all. You are the bread of life, dear Lord, to me. Your holy word, the truth that rescues me. Give me the wheat and live with you alone. Teach me to love your truth, for you are love. Let us now declare and proclaim our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. If you're using the hymnal and if this helps you, you'll find this on page 217. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with our prayers. Prayer is one of the things that Christians do. I was talking about that in the sermon. We come before God uh, with ourselves. We talk about the things that we need. We also talk about how grateful we are for what God has done for us. Here we have some prayers that have been prepared, a few more that we'll offer. And let us come now, not just as another thing to do in a liturgical order, but truly with our hearts open before God. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. You take resources that appear to be meager and bless them. And when you do this, there is enough. May your church trust that what you bless and ask us to share with the world is abundantly sufficient. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Your bountiful creation offers sustenance and life for all creatures. Protect this abundance for the well-being of all. Reverse the damage that we have caused your creation and be at work to preserve that which is around us. We pray for our local streams, and rivers for Lake Superior and all the Great Lakes, as well as the inland lakes, for our woodland, for farmland, 
replenish the groundwater supplies, provide needed rains in places of drought, protect forests from wildfires. We pray for those that are working to contain the fires in Siberia. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You offer yourself to all the nations and the peoples of the earth, inviting everyone to abundant life. Bring the prophetic vision to fullness, that all nations will run to you and that nations who do not know you will find their joy in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Hear the anguish of tender hearts who cry to you in suffering and satisfy their deepest needs. Bring wholeness and healing to those who suffer in body, heart, soul, and mind. We know we have people that we know who are recuperating or who are in the stage of testing or who are ill. Strengthen them, give them peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear them pray. Prayer. You offer freely the fullness of salvation. Give our congregations such welcoming hearts that our words and actions may extend your free and abundant hospitality to all whom we encounter. Even in these unusual times when we aren't supposed to get close physically. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. We pray an abundant blessing upon the Psalm Shared Ministry in their coming new season. We pray your abundant blessing upon Pastor Johnson in her moving and her getting ready to begin ministry. Strengthen her and bless all in these congregations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our local elections, which will be coming up soon and ask that your hand would be upon us and that you would be protecting those who come to vote. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. We pray for leaders within your church and most especially leaders within our denomination, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Make us humble and wise Bring forth capable people as laborers for your harvest field. And we lift up especially Bishop Catherine Finnegan and Bishop Elizabeth Eaton. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You gather your saints as one, united in the body of Jesus. Bring us with all your saints to the heavenly banquet. We remember with love and thanksgiving the saints that we have known. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We continue with the Thanksgiving prayer in the front part of the book, page 220. O oh God of justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need, awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end, bring all the world to your feast through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God of may the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 
the God of all grace, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 624. Jesus still in on to the rest we want, and although the way we choose, we will follow, come and fear Guide us by your hand through the promised land. If the way be dream, if the fool be near, let no faithless fears or tears, let no faith and hope forsake us. Safely pass the fool to our home we When we seek relief from a long felt when temptations from our glory make us patient and endure, show us that bright shore where we weep no more. Jesus, still in us, till our rest be won. Heavenly leaders still direct us, still support, console, protect us. Till we safely stand in the promised land. Go in peace. Remember the needy. Thanks be to God and peace be with you. I forgot one announcement, so I'll put it here. David Cowpey has been working on a, another um, little um, house for the new uh, free library, the free, uh, little free library. We've had one by our church building. Now there is one by the dog park, the Ironwood Dog Park, and go look at it, it's great. So, yeah. Peace be with you.